Hello, my name is Andrew Ahn Westover, and I'm the key pairing director of education and public engagement at the New Museum. I join you today from the unceded land of the Lenape people, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying respect to Lenape people and elders and ancestors, past, present, and future. On behalf of the New Museum, I'm glad to welcome you to today's conversation between Kevin Beasley and Gary Carrion Muriari. This program series includes over a dozen artists' conversations presented in conjunction with our current exhibition, Grief and Grievance, Art and Mourning in America. Programs like this are core to the New Museum's work of advancing new art and new ideas. I would particularly like to thank education and public engagement staff members, Andrea Calderes and Derek Wright, as well as the entire New Museum team for their help bringing this program together. New Museum digital initiatives are generously supported by Hermione and David B. Heller. We also thank our members and supporters like you who help make these programs possible. I'll now share brief biographical notes about this program's featured artist. Kevin Beasley lives and works in New York. Beasley's practice traverses sculpture, photography, sound, and performance while sourcing materials of culture and personal significance. From raw cotton harvested in Virginia to textured sounds gathered from contact microphones, Beasley's sculptural materials are altered, manipulated, cast, and molded to form a body of wall-based, freestanding, and sonic sculptures which acknowledge the complex shared histories of the broader American experience steeped in generational memories. Recent exhibitions include A for Arts Foundation in Cape Town, The Warehouse in Dallas, Baltimore Museum of Art, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Institute of Contemporary Art Boston, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and the Wexner Center for the Arts in Ohio, among many others. Beasley has recently performed at venues including The Kitchen, the Whitney Museum of American Art, Cynthia Woods Mitchell Center for the Arts at the University of Houston, the Art Gallery of Ontario, and many others as well. His work is held in public collections such as the Albright Knox Gallery in Buffalo, the Art Gallery of Ontario in Toronto, the Art Institute of Chicago, the Columbus Museum of Art, the Dallas Museum of Art, the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles, the Museum of Modern Art of New York, the Perez Museum in Miami, the San Antonio Museum in San Antonio, the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Studio Museum in Harlem, and the Tate Modern in London. I encourage you all to learn more about our upcoming public programs and our full suite of exclusive digital content on our website, newmuseum.org. And now, without further ado, I turn the conversation over to the New Museum's Krauss family curator, Gary Carrion Muriari. Hi, Andrew. Um, thank you very much for that introduction. And thanks to everyone out there uh, online for joining us. Um, I'm very excited to be in conversation with Kevin, as Andrew's mentioned. Um, Kevin is uh, I think one of our most distinguished young artists working today. And his work in the show, um, in, my, in my mind, plays a, plays a kind of pivotal role in, in the exhibition and the kinds of questions that the exhibition is asking about ways we um, choose to think about um, loss and memory, um, and I think in really, really, uh, in a really, really beautiful way. So, um, Kevin, um, it's great to see you. Thank you for joining us. Um, yeah, for sure. From the studio, um, it's a very um, <laughs> one of the more uh, enjoyable backgrounds I think we've seen um, in, in our chats thus far. So, um, maybe just to start, I think it's as as much as possible with with these conversations. I've tried to start with the work in the show, and then we can kind of see where that leads us um, in terms of questions in the work and. You know, for me, somebody I've, I've followed your work for many years now, and, and one of the things that I love about your work is kind of uh, the ways in which kind of different registers of time are built into your work. And I think you carefully built into your work, you know, both through material and process, but also through, you know, um, through personal memory, through references that are both individual and collective. Um, and, and maybe just to start, um, we'll have Derek pull up an image of the work in the show, which is Strange Fruit Pair One, which is from 2015. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about kind of um, the genesis of this work, you know, um, how you were dealing with materials at that moment in time and kind of what led to, you know, this particular um, accumulation of objects um, that we kind of see in the piece. Yeah, for sure. Um, thank you for having me. Thanks for uh, doing this, this conversation. Um, yeah, so this work actually um, is one that was, for me, was kind of fraught in its in its 
beginnings, its earliest beginnings, um, thinking materially about, you know, the work, about the the way that I'm I'm the way that I was working back in 2014, 2013, um, was really kind of dealing with these these uh, objects that were connected to me personally, but then also how those experiences with those objects and the kind of periphery around them uh, re reverberated or even echoed into maybe lar larger uh, and broader cultural themes. And, you know, uh, I had started a conversation with Catherine Brinson um, at the Guggenheim and she, you know, was organizing along with Nancy Spector um, the exhibition uh, storylines and they had commissioned me to to make a work basically and at the time I was I was you know uh, I had uh, I was working with these very very large uh, Jordans uh, sneakers that um, were a part of a, a, a few a one work in particular called uh, Jumped Man um, and I'd been thinking a lot about you know, the relationship between, you know, sneaker culture, but then also very specifically about Jordan brand and how that affects black youth and how that affects the way that people think about certain uh, uh, class status um, and where it exists in there, the nuances. Um, me, I never owned a pair of Jordans. So I always felt like these Jordans were like the first ones that I ever owned. Um, I had like the Scotty Pippins. Um, and, you know, this work really kind of, you know, thinking about these materials and thinking about how they would come together was always, there was always a reimagining around them, um, trying to recontextualize them. Um, I'm using a lot of my clothes at the time and just like really thinking about the experiences associated with them. And, um, you know, very directly, I, I started thinking about how uh, these objects that I was making, uh, their, their, their sort of read or even understanding as as a as having a close proximity to the body how that could be um how that could be be worked out or worked through and i always had this issue with hanging sculptures i always told myself that i would never hang a sculpture because i i felt like there was such a close relationship to the body that it felt like lynching to me right. and uh and then i i i like kind of checked this like myself in that way and thought about like, well, what would it mean and what would be in a, a work that I could hang? And and how could I situate the material in that way to maybe recontextualize them and, and maybe take this as a challenge? So I actually I actually ordered a punching bag just to kind of get used to having this sort of violent object um, hanging in my studio. One that I felt like I had to I had to like uh, develop some kind of language around, develop some kind of relationship to, and uh, really kind of understand the the sort of um, the consequences of making that kind of decision and what kinds of conversations would come up. And I did that, and uh, that was like really heavy in a lot of ways. And um, considering, you know, I was also in conversation with with uh, with the Guggenheim. Um, you know, the title of the show is Storylines. And so I felt like maybe it, it would be appropriate to, you know, think about uh, a, a certain kind of storytelling, but then also an opportunity to sort of generate a conversation. And for me, sound is always something that's like, goes hand in hand with the material uh, uh, language and the, and the actual physical um, tactile um, experience of, experiences of these objects. So it felt like, well, you know, one of the most, you know, e the easiest ways to kind of tell a story and to project a story is is through amplification. So, uh, so that this all, I'm like, sorry, I'm like drawing this out, but it's um, right. like kind of running through the the my my thinking during that time, and I, I felt like, well, you know, if I'm hanging a body, then there's a direct relationship to lynching, and. I immediately, you know, you hear Billie Holiday and Nina Simone and in some way thinking about, you know, the actual, uh, the actual poem, uh, which what which written by Abel uh, Mirapol, who who was a, a Bronx, I think he was a school teacher. Um, and that poem 
being translated into uh, into music, made made as a, as a way of of furthering uh, a level of expression, furthering its reach within uh, you know within society, and 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 also like you know putting it in the space of of your ear, right, like in the air, um, somewhere that that kind of exists physically. Um, pushing sound waves, but then also kind of touches you in, in a way that I think only music and sound is capable of. And sort of linking the, those kinds of conversations together and thinking like, well, maybe I can, I can kind of continue to pack all of these things together and think about maybe like, uh, you know, maybe think about the, the lives lost in, uh, in consumer culture, maybe think about, you uh, 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 certain neighborhoods that sort of deal with adversity due to class and, and economic strife. And I felt like, okay, there's a lot that I can have a conversation about alone. So maybe it's just a matter of joining these materials together and, and then, and then, and then hanging them and sort of, and sort of pointing very directly to, um, to this, this, this like, uh, overarching, um, uh, umbrella of violence that that we're that we're faced with and that we deal with that we're constantly engaging with, and how do we use this sort of moment or this time to actually speak to those things? And in speaking to them, you know, it, there's a there's a possibility of kind of generating something that uh, that can be very dark and very difficult and very tragic, um, but then also has a, a, a sort of um, a potential of evolving into something else. What that something else is, I think, deserves a certain level of stewardship. It deserves a certain level of um, of care. And uh, but I feel like that's there's a possibility in that. So um, yeah. So I think that that's maybe where initially uh, this work is coming from. And and these conversations that I was having uh, with Catherine sort of further, um, uh, I guess, further propelled that. In, in providing space that that it could that this work could kind of function in, and these ideas really. Yeah. I mean that's beautiful. I, you know I think that's um, you know uh, I, I think it's it's um, great in the way that you get at kind of like the um, you know the different kinds of narratives that I think you know a lot of your work deals with, but in this one in particular, part of what makes this work so effective is it, you know it's it's not just referential it's not just you know um you know the the um the recollection of lynching is not kept as a historical reference it's you know in, in many ways by this kind of active participation of the sound in the work it's you know implicating the viewer in in history in such a in a, in a really really kind of um evocative sort of way. I, I didn't actually think about the kind of history of, of hanging sculpture <laughs> generally, you know, I mean, obviously with in relationship to your work, but I mean, had you been thinking, you know, like, did you have to kind of grapple with that in terms of like once you started making a hanging sculpture? Cause obviously, you know, it's not, um, it, it's one thing for you to make it, but I think, you know, were you, you know, grappling with like the history of hanging sculpture more broadly, like, like through well, other historical figures or? I no, it, well, it was, for me, it was just like, I, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Like I just yeah. couldn't bring myself to doing it in the studio. Yeah. <laughs> and then, but then also like, you know, uh, oftentimes when I, when I did see uh, sculptures hanging, I it kind of like, it didn't sit right with me. It something about it, like, you know, maybe it's yeah. a chandelier or something. Right. And I, but I just, you know, it never, um, there weren't any examples that I saw that I think were really compelling that felt like uh, that felt like it, there could be this relationship to the body, and that we can also understand that as a sculptural form and as a part of the sculptural process, and also and also uh, uh, present the work or position the work uh, from some kind of hanging mechanism, mm -hmm. and that the hanging you know I, the hanging mechanism becomes a question you know even as like art handlers install things, you, you think about that connection point, you think about what that is. And um, in some way, you know, I, I also felt like, you know, the noose is tied within the work, not something that I've sort of shopped out and said like, okay, art installers, you've got to learn to tie a noose and you have to like tie it in this way. I felt like it was important that I learned how to tie a noose and understood 
the complexity of it, the strength of it, what it what it meant historically, um, what it feels like. And it's kind of like it's just like for me, it's like, oh, this is just like really hard work um to to sort of deal with but then also thinking that well i i feel like it's it's something that should be uh that, that should be understood in some way and sh- and we and should not be um uh pulled out of the 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 conversation or pulled out of the visual of the work simply because of that difficult um history um i think that sort of revealing revealing these these parts and revealing these things is so much a, a part of how we begin to reconcile them and i know for me it's something like i don't i i don't like i haven't made like subsequent like hanging works it wasn't like it was giving myself permission i think that it was just a it was something that i felt like i had to go through the process of um in order to to really understand what it means to make a work about um about you know the lynching of black people and that's like really, it's still something that I grapple with and I think about, but I don't, not like as a active process in the studio, it's something that when I look at that work, I think very much specifically about that. And, and that sort of leads itself to why it's a live work for me. It's something that is uh, capturing the moment. There's implications in entering the room with that work and that you must deal with that. And for me, uh, I felt like every time I go and I see it, I, you know, I have to like, I have to engage with it. I can't just stand back and just watch it. Um, there has to be some level of contact. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I think it also kind of, you know, it makes that sort of, um, uh, you know, it, it makes that historical, like the historical present, but it also makes like, you know, you start looking back, you know, from the present into history, which I think is also, you know, part of the the, Goal of I think maybe some other artists in the show too is you know that um, you know experiences of loss reverberate temporally you know in in both directions um, and I think that's you know I think something that's really um, true of your work because it has you know it has like just on a basic level these shoes that maybe are not your own have an indexical relationship to an individual but then that individual is then you know bound up with these other kinds of you know both contemporary experiences and and historical experiences and I think it's um, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, again, you know, something that's true, I think, across a lot of your work, you know, um, mm-hmm. you know, in terms of like, you know, the materials, you know, in particular, like, I, you know, I remember Jumpman, you know, um, which I think was in the biennial, was it in the Whitney Biennial, maybe the year, yeah, the yeah. year before, you yeah, know, before. in that case, you know, I think that um, the sneakers are even more um, visible as, you know, as like a, as a kind of consumer object, as a kind of icon of, of you know, of contemporary consumerism. You know, um, s- starting with this work, and then I think moving forward into some of your other pieces, you know, those objects, you know, do become subsumed into kind of larger, you know, um, you know, um, larger sort of sort of formal programs. Whether it's like you know something like you know expansive like um, the slabs, where it's you know you're dealing with like monumental abstract painting on a certain level. You know, yeah. at, at this point, were you starting to think about the kinds of you know that kind of like material transformation and what that might mean? for the um for the works moving forward yeah to some degree like you know i think that uh, you know it's like there's a lot i have a lot of objects in my studio <laughs> there's a lot of stuff things that uh are accumulated and you know quite simply it's like you know what is it's like oh well what's the relationship between this and this and how are these things uh how do they enter why why are they in my studio uh, what is it about my experience that becomes uh, that allows these things to exist in in this space? But then, but then also, you know, the decision to bring them into the studio is like, you know, maybe I should consider them beyond that kind of initial consumer level, or or that, you know, maybe it's like, oh, that looks really cool, like I want that. Or um, what is the relationship between that and um, you know my family, or uh, you know, geographically where I'm located. Um, and I and I go back to like me because I it's like that's what I have right like yeah. I don't want to like you know try and speak broadly for someone else uh, as much as I just think like okay well this is something that I have some understanding of but even within myself there's a lot to unpack and I feel like if it, it, the the deeper I get into those kinds of spaces with myself maybe the the more broadly things will kind of um, they'll start to to touch other things. And then you get ideas, right? Like how things become, how they're combined. Like, 
at some point you make a, a decision to say like, well, I'm, I'm very invested in a particular process um, or I'm very invested in, in sculpture, right? Like working in three dimensions. And then how do you push what that means? Like, you know, the question, like really kind of formal based questions like around relief. Like, what do you call a relief? Like a relief is a sculpture in a lot of ways, but the sort of emphasis on image making and the kind of frontal view suggest a really close relationship to, to painting and and image making. So how, you know, how am I, and then thinking about like viewing a sculpture in the round, right? Like you only, you know, you only have two eyes, you know, if you're, if you're lucky, right? And then you can, you can, you can only see a sculpture from one angle at a time. And then you have to move your body in order to understand what that thing is, but you never get to see the whole thing at once. So these kinds of questions and these kinds of things then allow me to think about okay, if I have these materials and I have these objects, then, um, you know, maybe I can, I can think about them, you know, formally in different ways and how they, how they tell us a particular kind of story and then how they may, may change the, uh, change what their, their intentions are or change what, what they're uh, capable of um, by sort of, uh, by changing the form. Um, and I think that's the exploration in the studio. And I think that's what keeps me moving and keeps me making, you know, uh, you know, the work evolving in that way is just trying to explore various ways of, 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 of telling these, these kinds of narratives, but also um, revealing aspects about these objects that we live with. And, 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 and the consequence of that is, or is the, the, the sort of people that we're connected to. Um, the, the varying uh, communities that you may not think you're a part of, but you are a part of because, because of its proximity or because of, you know, maybe something that you haven't quite understood about yourself that reveals itself later on. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know if that gets the answers the, the question, but um, yeah, no, I'm, for sure. <laughs> well, it, it brings up other questions, which is always the most <laughs> useful place anyway. So, um, you know, I think maybe I think another thing that actually happens with these works too is, you know, it like especially this piece is is also, you know, it it is so much affected by its surroundings and, the, and its context. And you know, obviously, like in, in some ways, like it, it may be the the narrative of the piece is maybe like overly determined in a context like this exhibition, where you know, like with such a heavy and like very you know weighted subject, you know, that takes on it, it maybe pushes the work and. In a, in a focus that maybe it wouldn't be if it was just in a solo exhibition or in some other context. But I think it, you know, it also breaks it up a lot by the way that the sound functions within it. And maybe you could talk a little bit about how you got to this point. You know, both um, this piece and maybe we'll go, we'll, we'll show uh, an image of the next uh, in the next piece, which is um, phasing ebb, which is another piece. Um, you know, which again, you know, suggests suggests both like you know the presence and absence of bodies, like you know missing bodies. Whether in this case, I think you know a more communal body. Um, but through the use of sound, it, it implicates the viewer in the piece and, um, and again, you know, suggests other kinds of times and other kinds of you know, ways about thinking about our relationship to the artwork. Can, can you talk a little bit about both with, you know, these two pieces, how, how you got to that point of using sound in that way and like maybe what yeah. works or doesn't work for you in, 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 in these particular pieces? Yeah, it's like, it's a strange trajectory because I, you know, I, I play some music, you know, and I, I've uh, kind of grown up playing the drums really specifically, but, um, but they were always separate. And, you know, I had eventually they, they had become, become apparent, the relationship between the two, just like physically, um, and actually through like DJing, right? Like, you know, being able to manipulate sound very physically and mixing things together um, was akin to the processes I was doing in the studio. So it felt like this, this, uh, equipment and these these devices and these things that you know are are meant to be used in one particular way could also function to in a way to to kind of reveal and understand something else that that I've been engaging in, which is dealing with like a, a kind of uh, this sort of cultural material and the residue of all of that. And you know I I've had collected a lot of field recordings and felt like kind of bored. At, with them because it was just about like you know the space and you know and not the 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 recorder which which was me right 
um, you know, you're always like quiet, you know, you're like doing a field recording and you're like quiet, you know, you're like tiptoeing around it and you're like, oh, it's like every field recording you hear, there's like some, some person next to that device. So whenever I like listen to field recordings, I like think about, oh, there's a person that's like standing there, but you just don't hear them, right? They like mask themselves. And so I, I had done that for a while where I started like just being like kind of ridiculous while doing field recordings. And it just felt like the microphone as a device became really important as, you know, how it's manipulated and, and what its structure is, right? So like embedding it inside of something or positioning it inside of something then conditions what that thing is supposed to be recording. And that's on top of what that physical space is, right? So like if it's a museum context or it's out in the field, there are there's there are relations there are reasons why you're there and there are cultural relationships to why you're there there's all this stuff you can begin to unpack in the recording of that space itself but then there's this other possibility in in actually trying to to develop or form something and and to me that felt like well i can i can then extend this this the the possibility of what this object or what this device is is capturing. It's not just capturing uh, uh, the space. It's capturing. It's 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 capturing itself. It's capturing the the uh, the. I guess you could say like the the sort of filtering the air, the the the, the people, the movement, the uh, the you know the privilege in that space, the challenges, the difficulties, all of these things. And so, you know, then it, the the microphone became you know, and, and we know this, right? Like you, some, someone with a microphone, you know, uh, can be a, a really sort of dangerous, could be seen as a very dangerous person given the, the power, the potential of that amplification. And so that then made me feel like, well, then this is, this becomes like a very active device or a very active thing to incorporate into these objects to then think about those implications uh, of entering into those spaces viewing or being in the presence of certain kinds of material. Um, this work, uh, uh, phasing, is, uh, is basically uh, the microphones are uh, placed within the museum or within the space in like a different location. And they're cabled back to, to, to the sculpture, which then is, you know, it has the amplification. So you have speakers that are embedded inside. And so then what you're hearing is you're, you're hearing, you know, the rest of the space without without you in it. And people don't really know, <laughs> like they don't, you know, you, you're literally just walking through and you're like, oh man, I like hate that word. Why is that still in the collection? Or why blah, 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 X, Y, and Z, blah, blah, blah. And then it's just like projected into this work. So it becomes, you know, a reflection of what those spaces are. Um, and And for me, it's really, you know, there's then this other conversation, yes, about like, you know, the kind of collective, the collectivity of that, the, you know, the, um, the, for me, it's like, you know, using these, these materials or using these house dresses um, is a, is a, is a kind of personal relationship to me, but also thinking about uh, uh, ghosts and thinking about voices that may not necessarily be in the room. Um, and their, their presence is, is felt and their presence is still there. And how do you compound all of that? materially into something um so yeah i i i'm still i'm still really invested in what that potential is um and kind of exploring you know materially what you know what this what these objects do but then also like sonically how um how they can address the context that these things are positioned in um yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, yeah, what I was thinking about also with those pieces with those pieces and and you know, those pieces in general, like of course I think about like, you know, pieces from the 60s and 70s that like did kind of dis destabilize the like the audience's, you know, like relationship to architectural space even through this kind of delay of sound like, you know, Dan Graham's pieces, but I also like think about the um that Rauschenberg piece soundings, like which was like that that kind of audio corridor that was like responsive to the um yeah. you know, to the like to the, the viewers kind of like movement through the space um and you know part of what i would love about your work though is like it's you know um it, it goes beyond the kind of traditional use of um found objects like you know 
to speaking to like a kind of like a sort of anonymous history, but like there's a, a what the sound allows you to do is to kind of redirect the audience's memory in I think a really targeted kind of way. So it's not just about you know yeah. you know the individual who wore those shoes or the individual who wore those clothes or like you know that sort of anonymity or like a generalized it it, it can be, it can tell like larger kinds of narratives, um, you know that again like you know um, you know maybe are not what we come in expecting to see. Um, so, you know, I jumped, I had a Derek jump ahead to the piece um, uh, in Morningside Park, because maybe that's a way to think about like the kind of expansiveness of those kinds of narratives um, and, and maybe the way that your work can function in, function in, in, a, in a larger public sphere. Um, you know, can you talk a little bit about how, you know, you just decided to take on, you know, such a, you know, both like both the physically large space, but also like, you know, I think, you know, historically large space, Morningside Park is such an important, you know, place within, you know, everybody's experience of the city. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, that Yeah, that was something that I I had to kind of deal with. Um, and, and this was also uh, a commission through um, uh, the Studio Museum in Harlem's in Harlem pr uh, project, which just basically, you know, which is, I thought I was just like, was, thought it was such a brilliant idea is just thinking about how, uh, you know, we can use the public parks and use the public spaces in order to, to ad address issues that the institution does, uh, you know, within its walls. And when I, I was invited to, to propose something for this, I just immediately um, was thinking about these acoustic mirrors and there, there's, it's a form that I've really tried to, to understand its possibility and thinking about um, communicating or transmission, thinking about like growing up and it's like, oh, like, you, you know, when you have the, the satellite dish off the back of your house or whatever, it like meant something. It's like, oh, you got like, well, you, you got like direct TV or something. You got some, something big going on there. Um, and then everyone had it and now no one has them at all kind of thing. Um, but there was something about uh, really a, a thinking about them from the standpoint of, of communication and thinking about listening and the, them as like a, them as a, as a, as a tool. And what happens when that tool is made out of a, a really particular kind of material and that material also you know, there's always a, a moment or possibility to kind of read into the work and read into what, what the what that that form could be could be addressing or what it could be used for, and these were, you know, the title is "Who's Afraid to Listen to Red, Black, and Green?" And really, it's to me, it's like just just trying to find like a meeting or a center point where uh, where there's a there's a possibility of discussing gentrification of Harlem really specifically in Morningside Park as like a, a kind of dividing line or you know a line that that becomes contested um, on the on the west side in a lot of ways uh, watching it evolve and I you know I just I felt like this was a really sort of appropriate way of, of thinking about um, these materials which to me it was also like really important that you know, the dress shop where I was purchasing all of these house dresses from is, is based in Harlem. And so kind of relocating them back within the neighborhood or within the community in some way um, felt felt poignant or felt like, like, okay, there's some real tactility there. Like, yes, they've gone, they've been processed and they've gone through the studio and they've been reimagined, but thinking about their trajectory kind of landing back in Harlem in a, in a more public way, the way that you kind of walk into a shop or you, you know, you walk down the street. Um, and that felt really important. So, you know, this, this work I felt like was really deeply about a conversation and, and thinking about the, the public park or the public space as being one where this, these conversations could happen. Um, but, but ultimately that, you know, the idea of listening is so is so core and so crucial and i think oftentimes is just forgotten about or or is sort of looped into like a facet of development right you know um yeah 
And you know how, I mean, I mean, this is always sort of a weird question, but like, it, especially because they're in a, a public place, like, you know, how, like how effective were they for you in terms of like the way that they were experienced by, by people in the community and, you know, like how were you able to like, you know, observe or kind of measure that response? I think, you know, it's weird. It's like, cause I think if there wasn't social media or like Instagram, then I would have no understanding. I would, I would, I would just, you know, I, I've, I couldn't be there every day. And I think that that's like the reality of, of, you know, visual artists is that you, you know, you don't, you don't have like a, a guard standing there, like clicking or recording everyone's like t every time they approach your work and they look at it and they, you know, and not everyone then expresses how they feel. So I felt like um, social media actually was a space where I could get some sort of feedback and see how it's, how it was functioning. And the people were just, you know, I, I had, there were a lot of posts where people were just kind of you know, they were either taking pictures of it or they're standing in front of it taking pictures or they're, you know, there's always some like picture taking photo op thing that that can be weird, but also uh, is some kind of thing. Um, and I think that ultimately uh, it would be, you know, the, the it was up for a year. Um, but I think what would be ideal is that if they were they were up like permanently where then they could, there could be some programming established around them. And that was a part of like the original idea was I was like, oh, there would be like per performances that could take place and they would kind of create a stage for something where, where people could, could, uh, could convene. And I think ultimately having it in a public park suggests that positioning them in a way that wasn't so intrusive and take over uh, the space that it was, that it rendered it unusable. Um, it, it very much so felt like it was a part of the context. So yeah, I like, I'm not too, I'm not too sure <laughs> what other than like those things, like how it was received or if those things. And I think in, in that way, it's like, maybe it's like the, the ambition to generate the work or the idea or the intention going into it is not necessarily what comes out, but to know that that's embedded in the possibility of what the work is, feels to me like that's, that's as much as I could do and it's as much as the studio museum could do as well. So I felt like we we were able to to really generate something I thought was really really powerful. Um, and you know it was funny because actually I I had a family reunion in the park like later in the year, and we as a family we like walked up there to like see it. So that was like really special, you know, having family that like grew up. In, in Harlem and then everyone kind of walking and then being able to like spend time with the work and talk about it and laugh and like everyone's got like ribs and like you know a beer or something in their in their hands so it that that but that's like a personal anecdote <laughs> um, but, but, but I mean really I think that's what I, I love that about the work because I think that you know if you think about like the way that public art or public monuments you know um, address a, address an audience or address a community like you know what I loved about these pieces was that it you know was that it, they were inviting collaboration and they were and you know in essence reflecting the community back on itself which I think is a really in, in many ways like what you could, the best you could hope for with a with a piece of, of you know of something that's categorized under public art and I think that's you know the generosity of that was really special to me mm -hmm. um, so it's great that it was also a personal you know that it was also something you know that you're part of that too. It's not, you know, it's not, um, it's not just, you know, a separate, it's not coming from the outside. It's really coming from the community. Um, and I think that's right, great. Right. Um, maybe if we go to the next piece that also, you know, um, you know, I'm, I'm interested in the way that, you know, again, this, you know, like the, the kind of like the openness of your, of your objects to like, to bring in other, you know, other narratives, but also, you know, to invite um, to both like implicate the viewer, but in, a, in some cases to kind of like, you know, invite collaboration to different degrees. Um, and you know, maybe you could talk. I, I, I'm sure maybe not. Some people in New York maybe didn't see this piece, but this was in um, in a group show in Chicago, uh, and I saw this piece, but I didn't actually see the performance. Um, but yeah. if you skip to the next image as well, you'll see um, this is um, your face is is not enough. And so the next image is also this is I think it being activated for the Liverpool Biennial, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. Um, this one is yeah. Yeah. So could you talk a little bit about these pieces? You know, these are, you know, these are objects with a, a very different kind of history around them that you're using and, and different kinds of associations, but, you know, both like, you know, how you constructed the objects and then like, you know, what, 
the kind of nature of the performance and how that sort of transformed those those kinds of associations. Yeah, I mean, this was really like you know, uh, yeah, man, <laughs> this is like so much. It's like I feel like I pack so much in, into the work that I'm like, where do I start? You know, like what what's where should the conversation, you know, what 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 becomes important to kind of uh, emphasize because I think then things kind of fan out and you know so much so much for me like this was you know after you know after coming off of you know uh you know uh the the Mike Brown incident and thinking about Ferguson all of this sort of protesting that happened and the dissent and what what I saw as like you know, again, we were we were experiencing this moment of militarization that was was like it was like, oh yeah, let's dust them off, boys. Let's like get these going. And then it's like, you know, this is the this is the potential, right? Like this is the potential of of what that uh what that defense fund really does politically. And and you and the sort of the images from from uh from Ferguson protests, the 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 amount of sort of violence that the police were exerting. Um, to me, I just like kept thinking about like, well, what if everyone had gas masks, right? Like, you know, what if this this playing field was a was a bit more equal in some way? And and that and that was just like those those kinds of things were just like running through my head the whole time. Um, and uh, I felt like in some way um, a, a friend a friend had had mentioned to me that you know like oh well you know in israel growing up uh they would issue gas masks to citizens and it was a it was a program you had like a government right to a gas mask and uh and for me like that that was a really kind of remarkable thing to think about uh, uh a particular uh geographical location that that then felt like politically that this was the that this was the 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 answer to um, to 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 uh, certain kinds of conflict, and for me, I, I kept thinking about well, how then does does that play a role in in accessibility? How does that play a role into to who gets these kinds of things in a more broader in a more broader approach? Um, and then what does it mean for your identity? What does it mean for your, your sort of, your, uh, your face, your facial recognition? Um, and that, man, I'm like, this is like so much to like <laughs> to talk about, but, um, you know, this work was really kind of, for me, centered around thinking about a performance that would, uh, that would locate a gas mask in a way that would, that could kind of speak about the varying uh, uh, relationships to location and varying relationships to, to the way that people look or, or kind of express themselves. Um, but then also like, you know, this like way of kind of incorporating 12 functional gas masks within a building um, and that they would be on display and that in some way, which I, I don't think would never happen. So I, I, but I like imagine, right? Like that if you ever needed a gas mask, you would just like grab the, you would grab one and you would like put it on and then you'd like run out in the street. Um, and like the art, I think like art institutions have, you know, this force field around them that, you know, makes that level of accessibility seem unimaginable. Um, but for me, like to imagine something like that and to then think like, well, this is, well, but maybe this should be here, right? Like maybe this is something we, we should try or I should try and uh, and then see what happens. Um, and that the mega the, the megaphones are are also like fully functional. So they become like alarms in, in a way. They become ways of again like amplifying the voice um, and amplifying our our vocals. Um, and the performance was really about breathing and the most sort of basic uh, way of signaling uh life or signaling you know yourself um and you know the the score that i wrote was you know you take three breaths and then you just like sustain like an ah sound for as long as you can and then you stop and then you do it again and you do that 
I think it's like 25 times or 30 times or something. And, and the breath in between is really your moment of, of sort of rest and, and, and yeah. And, and then it creates a kind of symphony uh, with everyone doing that. Um, and yeah, and that the timing gets off and everyone's kind of doing their own timing because it's just based on their own level of breathing. But um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of how this work sort of functioned in, I think in, the, in, its, in its core, um, but there are all of these other sort of possibilities in, in what it's doing um, when, it's, when it's activated and then when it's not. Yeah, I mean, and they, you know, I mean, there's, there's such strange objects, like they have a, such a strange presence, you know, before you even transform them, you know, gas masks, you know, in general are, a, it's a, a completely bizarre, you know, formal object um, uh, that once you, yeah, once you've done it, it becomes something altogether kind of otherworldly. I mean, did it read differently in Liverpool as opposed to like, you know, in, in Chicago? I mean, you know, obviously like there's a, 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 a history of protest and you know like it's not an you know in, yeah. in liverpool is just as there is in chicago but you know did the work change for you in that context um, i you know it was wild because i actually felt like it um it it grew like it, it i then felt like well maybe the work isn't just the installation and actually the work is is so much about the people right so you know, the performers at Liverpool were totally different group than the performers uh, in Chicago. And those groups, you know, the way that I engaged with them and the relationships that I like built with them and communicating what how they would do it, like we did rehearsals and, and, they, and they're just like anyone that was interested kind of thing. Like it, right. it's not like particular performers or having any, any real, real experience really. It's just if you would like to do this, you know, you're going to be in this gas mask for like an hour um, or longer. And it was really, and they're heavy and they're like, you know, they're just awkward. And um, if this is something you'd want to do, then, uh, then yeah, this is available. Um, and I think that the, the, the level of communication, trying to impart a certain level of, of sensibility, allowing people to to be um, to be expressive in how they are experiencing each other, how they're experiencing themselves in this thing, what they're thinking about, because the instructions are not that complicated. You know, there's a procession in the beginning where everyone's walking through the museum with the masks on, and you're doing it at your own, again at your own pace, and and then everyone kind of comes to, convenes uh, by in, in next to the installation. And then, and then they, and then everyone sort of, you know, they begin. And when you, when you begin, it's, you know, you're, you're, it's so much about you're listening to everyone else as much as you're about listening to yourself. Um, and then thinking about that breathing, it's like, you know, this is the breathing is important. It's like really important. So that's like what you're, that's like what you're doing is you're just like breathing in this thing. And how do you, uh, how do you really really focus on that um, as, as a way of, of, of completing the work. And so each time these conversations were, uh, were had with the performers, it, it felt like the work was growing and growing and growing and growing, right? where it's like, oh, well, this is such a necessary part of, of this work that the next time it'll be a, a much larger group and the work will continue to grow. And the, the more it sort of travels and moves around, I think the 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 more the more uh, the more it solidifies or begins to to do something. Um, so I think that yeah, I think Liverpool really revealed that to me, um, and in in effect started to to shift. Even so, the 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 what I thought was maybe the importance of the work, and and I think it's like people in the room, right? Like everyone kind of convening um, and and breathing. <laughs> really um yeah no i mean i think that's really uh, um, what is so beautiful about uh, beautiful about so much of your work is that you know that capacity to change and that openness to be affected by others and um and to kind of um 
sort of encourage that uh, that reflexivity, you know, for those of us who engage with the object, both in an institutional space and in other arenas as well. Um, you know, we're running a bit out of time, and I don't want to um, keep you forever. We didn't actually even make it to the Whitney piece, but maybe Derek, you could just show the um, image of your installation at the Whitney, which was um, the absolutely an, an incredible installation i'm sure everybody on this call um, is very familiar of a view of a landscape um, um a cotton gin motor which is a uh, was a really incredible installation um but I, maybe i'm not going to make you talk about it so much because i think you have talked about it a ton um <laughs> we're kind of nearing the end but i I'm, we're going to open up the chat for just a minute um and if anybody has um, a question that jumps out right off the bat um and we can i will be happy to take it and derek i don't know if you need to do anything to all right there it goes away. Um, but in the meantime, we should say, you know, you also did, um, you know, recently completed an exhibition um, in Cape Town, South Africa, which I think was yeah. um, to me, which, you know, another really incredible project where you, you know, some of the through lines of your work from the beginning, you know, whether it's this kind of relationship between objects and people and, and complicated histories of labor and, um, and exploitation and, um, and capitalism yeah. are really um, bound up. I think you really explored that in a really deep level. Maybe we can just show one image of that while we're waiting to see if anybody has a question. Um, Derek, do you mind pulling up the, the image? Um, if you go, thank you. One more. Okay, this one and then the, then the next piece again, you know, where you're working with, um, you know, with material like you know site-specific material you're working in the space but also with material that also like is part of a, an economy of of um of goods like a global economy of goods that is i think is like often hidden from view and i think that's also like your work is great about re doing is kind of revealing these these paths and these histories and these um um and these uh um relationships that are kind of invisible um to the naked eye so, um maybe do you want to just say a little bit about you know um how you approach that experience of like of working in Cape Town? Yeah, I mean, th that was, you know, initially, uh, I did a site visit in, uh, it was in 2019. And it was still undecided on whether, like, I would be making work in New York, and then shipping it or would be there and working. And after visiting and being there, I was like, Oh, my God, like, there's no way I'm gonna like make work, and then just like send it over. Like there's like it's so dense, it's so intense there, and I I just I felt like I had to be I had to just be present and use utilize what what what, what materials and things that would be available to me, and in part I think that that was through uh, through a four um, Josh the director there was very thorough about showing and sharing aspects of Cape Town specifically. Um, that uh, that could be of importance to me or, or things that were, you know, kind of volatile or things that, you know, like this is where you are and this is some of this is some of the history and, you know, we can't pack it all in a week, but we can we can do we can do a lot. Um, so I, I felt like my experience there was half of it was spent gathering and experiencing things. This work in particular um, is made of like a hundred of these African tourists objects. And I felt like it was the one thing that as a tourist that I, that, you know, that's, that there's an industry around these objects that are also kind of rooted in something like they're hand carved, right? And the industry yeah. is, is, is very much so rooted in, uh, in, in, uh, in spirituality, in, um, in geography and location and history and different kinds of tribes and 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 what what kind of trades that they engage in in order to sustain themselves um, and a lot of times they uh, you know they get misused and mispurposed and ultimately they end up as tourist objects for you know Westerners to come and like say my I got my little African thing going and it's it's kind of it's troubling and. I felt like maybe this was the one thing that I had, you know, that I have to really engage with. And so I, I like put them all in a block of resin yeah. and there's like a hundred of them. Um, and I, you know, I don't, yeah. So that it that felt like a gesture or felt like something that, um, that was really necessary to me and you can't really recognize them, but in a lot of ways it's, 
um, yeah, it could be seen as as being both something very difficult and very tragic. Um, but then also um, there is a there is a solidity to that, and there is a you know there is an economy around it. Yeah, and um, it's also you know it's it's that's a it's also like a a, a global like economy too. Like that happens in every place. You know, like my family's from from Peru, and that's like you know that those same kinds of like systems of production <laughs> exist there yeah. too for the same purposes. Yeah. And, and like yeah, the like I love it. it gets at the sort of bulk of that, the like the scale of that too. Is that like, like what that piece also kind of suggests in a really yeah impressive way? So I think we have one question which maybe speaks to this a little bit. Like you know when you're so it's like if there's a level of intuition that you work with when creating your work and working with materials and maybe it could even speak to something like that piece or you know some of the other pieces with with fabrics that you use there like you know in terms of like you have these objects that have you know that have are, are kind of suffused with meaning um yeah. uh, you know like then what's the pro like how do you then yeah. approach like making the object you know making your own object uh, yeah that well that's the that's kind of the fun part is the play right like i always I always feel like if I'm if I'm doing the due diligence, like in the the beginning, right? Like if I'm, you know, before something enters into the studio, I'm really kind of thinking about it deeply and thinking about its relationship to history, generationally, also like what my relationship is, and um, is this something that I should do or shouldn't? But like once it gets on the other end of that, like kind of scrutinizing then it becomes like, it is. there's a lot of play, you know? Then there's improvisation, there's, you know, there's mixing and chopping, there's there's all of these things that begin to happen that are about furthering that, that sort of dive, that deep dive, but then also in a lot of ways kind of challenging maybe the initial ideas or maybe even the initial notions that I may have, uh, that may have allowed the work to enter into the studio. So there's not, it's like, there's nothing that comes in that I don't think is of consequence or that I think I'm, uh, that I should be uh, really, really addressing or, or doing or dealing with. But after, but then after that, I think it's, there's a lot of play and that becomes really, that's like really enjoyable, you know, because formally I, I like, I like to exercise those things. I like to, I like being an artist, right? Like I like playing with color and I like thinking about you know, uh, form and mass and all of these kind of like formal qualities of making. I like, I, I love all of that. Like it's necessary for me to be physically making with my hands. Um, so I, yeah. So then th that stuff, at least the sort of formal play has a really sort of solid foundation of consideration, but then also like rigor that, that supports it. And that allows me to then say, well, let's like mix and mash these things together. Let's like look at art, let's like look at art historically and certain certain formal qualities and and play with that, see how that functions um, with, uh, with with this kind of content or with these this subject matter. Well, I think that's like one thing that it doesn't come across in a talk like this too, I think is just like the the depth, you know, the, the formal depth of your work. And I think the joy that, you know, like the experience, like the, you know, the physicality and the materiality, like the joy that you take in that, that comes through when you're experiencing those works in person. And um, so hopefully everybody here can get a chance to at least see the work in Grief and Grievance. And I'm sure we'll be seeing plenty more of your work in, in the city and elsewhere in the years to come. Um, but I think for now, I think that's great. Kevin, uh, thank you so much. It really is a pleasure to, to talk to you and, and thanks for taking the time and, and hopefully we can see you again soon. Yeah, yeah, thanks Gary. Thank you all. All right, thanks everybody.